Hey everyone, uh, my name is Jameson Tool. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Fritz, and I'm really excited to be talking with everyone about artificial intelligence at the edge. Uh, so before we get started, uh, just a couple things. Uh, number one, if you're the type of person who likes to dive right in, uh, feel free to check out our developer community at heartbeat.fritz.ai. Uh, we've also got a demo app um, for iOS. It's got about five different neural networks, uh, all in an iPhone app. They run directly on your phone, sort of give you a taste of the sorts of things that you can build by incorporating machine learning and deep learning into your applications. And then we've actually open sourced all of the code for that app. If you go to bit.ly slash heartbeat source, uh, you can see the entire project, fork it, modify it, uh, and use it for your own projects. Um, while you're doing that, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, so I started out as a physics major a long time ago at the University of Michigan. I came to Boston in 2010, did my PhD at MIT. Uh, and my background is all in the data science machine learning side of things. Uh, so you know, before I was analyzing uh, much larger data sets in the cloud and now as the co-founder and CEO of Fritz, I'm focused on helping developers move some of those models and algorithms down to edge devices like your phone. I wanted to just start by uh, getting everyone on the same page here, um, defining some terms and talking about where I really think we're headed over the next five to ten years. Uh, and that is towards a world with edge intelligence powered by centralized learning. So you know, we currently have sensors uh, in everything. There are accelerometers, cameras, uh, GPS, you know, in our mobile phones and all of these smart devices, and they are collecting uh, you know, tons of information in real time. Uh, so much information that we've had to develop these machine learning and AI algorithms to extract you know, only the relevant bits. Uh, and those inferred uh, pieces of information are then passed along to an application layer that acts on them. So, uh, you know, it turns the self-driving car to the left, uh, it recognizes your face and unlocks your phone. And today, Building uh, the best new products and new user experiences are all about completing this loop as fast as possible. So sensing, inferring, acting, sensing, inferring, acting. And uh, there's actually so much data coming from so many of these sensors that uh, the network becomes a big bottleneck. So sending all of this data over uh, cellular networks to be processed in the cloud and then sending it back down to, to devices uh, slows this loop down. And what that means is that we actually have to move the inference step uh, down to as close to the data as possible directly on the devices and that's what we really mean by edge intelligence so we're still training things in the cloud for now but the deployment uh, goes directly down onto the devices and when we do this it really allows us to solve what we call these 60 frame per second problems um, so this is a mobile phone it's got uh, snapchat running on it and you know snapchat's entire user experience is really built off of processing live video uh, in real time. And so, you know, as a user, you look at your phone and Snapchat detects your face, uh, your eyes, your nose, and puts a dog filter uh, on it. And this just wouldn't work if you had to send that live video up to the cloud for processing and then send it back down to your phone. You know, it would take seconds or minutes uh, to get a single Snapchat sent and it would, you know, completely uh, kill your, your data. So what Snapchat had to do was actually bake those neural networks to detect faces directly into the application code so that it could be run uh, on that live video at 60 frames per second. Uh, and we're seeing you know, many, many apps take advantage of this uh, to get better, faster user experiences and also uh, to get you know, more ambient um, and frictionless user experiences. So this phone is actually the, the Pixel 2, uh, which has a special uh, uh, feature where the phone and the microphone is constantly listening for music in the background. And when you lift your phone up, uh, it has already done uh, you know, in the background, a lookup of what song is playing, and it will show you sort of like Shazam directly on, on the phone screen uh, what music is playing. And so, you know, this is the same type of technology that's listening for, you know, words like Siri and Alexa. Uh, and these ambient user experiences are really powered by uh, running neural networks continuously directly on the device without having to send all of this data back. Um, there are other benefits to moving machine learning models down to edge devices as well. Uh, so, 
you know, privacy is obviously in the news a lot lately, and running these machine learning models directly in apps is actually a way to get all of the benefits of machine learning, um, but also take user privacy into account. Um, so, you know, take Apple's Face ID, for example. Uh, there, they're using a neural network. Uh, you calibrate your device when you first set it up and they store a 3D you know, profile of your face in an encrypted vault directly on the phone. Uh, then when you go to unlock it you know, later on, uh, they take another 3D scan, uh, use a neural network to extract uh, those features and compare it to the one that they've stored previously in that encrypted vault. If it's similar enough, your phone gets unlocked. And so uh, this is a case where you know, this feature, this frictionless feature, the user, user experience, is all being done directly on the device. So the neural network lives there, the encrypted vault uh, with your uh, initial calibration scan lives there, and then even that step when you're unlocking your phone, that data never leaves your device. And so you get best of both worlds, both privacy and all of these features powered by machine learning. And then the last reason that you would want to move uh, machine learning models down to edge devices is one of cost. Uh, so pictured here are Google's new uh, TPUs, so they're tensor processing units, specialized server-side processors uh, designed just to do the sorts of matrix multiplications required by neural networks. And we sort of think of cloud computing as a second order tax on you know, all of our businesses, but if you're doing a lot of machine learning or deep learning especially, uh, those costs can really add up. So these TPUs right now are about $6.50 per hour. Uh, GPUs are also really expensive compared to the types of servers you would run you know, web applications from. And so uh, by moving your machine learning models down to devices, you're actually using uh, the CPUs and GPUs on mobile phones, which you don't pay for, right? Uh, you know, that is uh, not something that you're gonna get charged for. And so you can reduce the cost of your compute bills quite significantly by moving this processing off of uh, the cloud and down onto user devices. And all three of these things, better user experiences, more privacy, and lower costs are, you know, leading to this transformation and you know I want to make sort of a bold claim here which is that I actually think that uh, edge devices are going to come to dominate the inference portion of AI and machine learning very very quickly. Uh, so this picture in the background here is um, a photo taken by my co-founder uh, as he was flying through Singapore and you know you can read up there this is Huawei advertising their flagship phone but the tagline that they have chosen for this device is that it's got the world's first AI processor inside. And so, you know, you're seeing the flagship phones uh, from all of the major mobile manufacturers right now are including AI-specific uh, hardware accelerating chips within their devices um, because they understand that developers want to move these uh, models and the inference steps down to um, edge devices. And there's so many of these phones, you know, billions out there, uh, that this is really going to be the dominant place that AI models get executed. So if we think about the growth then of AI uh, over the next you know, five to ten years, it's really going to be fueled by this transition to the edge. So you know, we currently have edge intelligence today. We have apps like Snapchat, we have smart speakers uh, like the Amazon Echo, and we have self-driving cars and autonomous drones that are leveraging this technology today. Uh, in the near future, I think you're going to see that mobile is going to really dominate the inference side of uh, AI and machine learning. And then in the future, uh, the processing power is going to catch up as well as our training algorithms to the point where I actually think you're going to start seeing people training their models in a distributed fashion on edge devices. And again, you know, that just sort of amplifies all of the other reasons that you might want to move there. Training on the edge is more private, um, you can leverage uh, many more devices and reduce your cost that way. So what about the state of edge computing right now? Uh, currently, uh, it's actually a little bit frustrating to work with some of this technology. The biggest reason is that there is a tech stack mismatch. Uh, so you know, I'm a machine learning engineer. I use Python, uh, TensorFlow, and Jupyter Notebooks, and then I deploy to cloud services. I don't know anything about Swift or iOS app development. Uh, so it's very hard for me to get my machine learning models into mobile user experiences. On the other side of that, Mobile developers are great at building those experiences, but they don't have the backgrounds, uh, they don't have PhDs in machine learning to you know, really understand exactly how those neural networks need to be implemented. And what this means is, you know, if you're a company, it's very hard to find 
engineers that can take you end to end, that can do the machine learning side of things and the mobile side of things. And that's very difficult uh, if you're trying to hire. Even if you can do that uh, and you know, build these models, deploying them and managing them over time is uh, quite difficult these days. So there's a lot more hardware that you have to worry about and hardware that you don't control when you start deploying onto edge devices. So you might have to deal with thousands of different uh, mobile phones or IoT devices with dozens of different chipsets and a handful of different operating systems. All of that uh, is something that you need to manage. You need to test everything uh, for performance, for errors, and maybe create multiple versions to support all of those different hardware devices. And then you know, the infrastructure that we currently have uh, to take you know, research and development into machine and deep learning to actual production within applications is still quite fragile. There's a lot of steps that we have to go through to convert and optimize and compile and deploy. Uh, and each one of those steps right now is, is pretty brittle. Um, and they can fail in these unexpected ways. So uh, before I really get into uh, the meat of you know, this conversation, I want to hopefully inspire uh, some people with some specific use cases for why you might want to move machine learning models down to the edge and what it can really enable. Uh, so this is one of the first applications to leverage Apple's Core ML, you know, on-device uh, model execution framework. And it's an app called Magic Sudoku. And what you do is you point your uh, camera at a Sudoku. It uses computer vision uh, and neural networks to detect which numbers are in which boxes. It then solves the Sudoku and uses the augmented reality features to superimpose the solution directly onto the piece of paper. Uh, this is an app called Instasaber, and uh, this guy right here uh, trained his own neural network uh, to recognize a rolled up piece of paper and then estimate the position of it and orientation, and then uh, attached a lightsaber blade to it. So this app's called Instasaber. It works really well. You can download it, play around with it yourself. Um, this is a cool application that I wanted to highlight, not so much because the you know, neural network is very complicated or it you know, does this crazy computer vision, Thing, um, but it's really just an example of how I think you're going to see machine learning and deep learning proliferate through user experiences more generally. Um, so this is a nice open source app. Um, it's to track workouts uh, on, on iOS. And the goal here was to categorize a user's workout as you know, chest day or arm day or leg day based on the exercises and the number of reps that an individual had done. And you could think about writing a bunch of procedural code and a bunch of if statements to say, you know, if um, you know, this exercise was done, then it's probably a back workout. Uh, but instead, this developer trained a very simple four-layer four -layer neural network to simply predict uh, which category, which type of workout it was from all of these input exercises. And so here, you know, you can avoid all of these procedural lines of code by just training a very simple neural network uh, very quickly. You don't need a lot of data, you don't need a lot of expensive GPUs, and it just makes that user experience uh, much more fluid for the user. And then the last uh, piece of inspiration in this section uh, is a project out of Facebook's research. It's called Dense Pose. And here they're taking uh, you know, single frames from a video and identifying all the individuals and then actually building a 3D mesh from every single person. Uh, and so, you know, you think about in just a few years, we've gone from Snapchat being able to detect your face and putting uh, a filter on it to actually being able to uh, build a 3D model of an entire person or multiple people within a shot uh, just from you know, 2D images. You may have some questions about you know, what can machine learning and deep learning currently solve um, and what can it really, you know, have we not uh, figured out yet? And this is a great uh, project done by EFF. Um, they've gone through thousands of research papers, categorized dozens of different machine learning tasks, and plotted out over time you know, how are our machine learning models doing relative to a human baseline. And so you can see on the left here, um, this is an image recognition task. And we've back in 2015, uh, we have models now that can surpass human performance, recognizing uh, what an image is. On other tasks, like the visual question answering, so these are open-ended questions, <clears throat> such as, you know, how many bananas are in this photo, or uh, is the person pointing up? And on these sorts of things, models are doing fairly well, actually, you know, 67% accuracy, uh, but we're not anywhere near uh, the level of humans yet. So uh, check out this project by EFF. They have tons of different algorithms, tons of different references to papers. Uh, it's a really great resource. 
All right. So for the remainder of this talk, I want to really dive into the details of doing machine learning on the edge. Uh, and this really comes down to managing the entire life cycle of models, uh, specifically on mobile devices. Uh, and before we get into this, I just want to set some expectations. Uh, so, you know, a lot of you have probably worked with uh, various steps in this process in the cloud. I want to talk specifically about what's different about these things at the edge. So it's not going to be um, you know, super general about how to train models. It's going to be focused uh, specifically for doing these steps on edge devices. Uh, and I'm going to talk about deep learning a lot, but uh, traditional machine learning techniques from linear regression to you know, random forests and decision trees, those are also candidates for moving down to edge devices. Um, deep learning is certainly in vogue these days, uh, but traditional machine learning is totally fun as well. And then the last thing is, you know, I'm going to talk a lot about tools and concepts and, you know, hopefully give you a base to go off and dig deeper, um, but I'm not going to get too uh, bogged down in code itself. All right, so here is an overview of the life of a mobile machine learning model. Uh, and we start at the top here with collect. Uh, so you got to collect some data, you then train your model with it, uh, optimize things for deployment on edge devices, convert to a mobile friendly format, make sure it's protected when you deploy out onto all of those devices, and then monitor that over time. And you know this process sort of never stops. You always want to be collecting data, retraining models, and going through all of these steps again. So I'll start with uh, the collect step. If you haven't collected a data set that you're interested in using already and you're looking for a place to get started, um, the amount of open source, uh, you know, publicly available data is really incredible these days. Um, there's a number of sources I've listed here, listed here on the left. Um, if you want a more exhaustive list, uh, deeplearningforj.org slash open data has you know, 50 to 100 different open source data sets. Uh, they're large, they're very well documented. Um, there's really no excuse not to get started. I've, on the right here, I've shown an image from the Coco data set just to give you an idea of like, the level of quality here. There are thousands, tens of thousands of images like this where people have painstakingly drew you know, pixel by pixel uh, boxes around every single object and labeled every single object. Uh, and you can use that to train a variety of different models. Uh, once you start with a data set, it's generally good practice, no matter where you're going to deploy things to, to augment that data. Uh, and when you're thinking specifically about deploying to mobile devices, you want to make sure that the training data is going to match production situations as closely as possible. Uh, so here, you know, I've taken an input image of this cat, and in four lines of code, uh, I have generated three additional images that are meant to mimic uh, things that you are going to see, especially when deploying models onto edge devices. So, you know, rotating images because someone's holding the phone in their hand, uh, images that are blurry because things are moving very quickly and the cameras might be not very good, uh, and then you know, darkening things because a lot of times we're trying to take pictures of things in low light situations where there's some additional camera noise. And so this can increase the amount of data that you have in a very cheap way, and, you know, you want to make sure that uh, the data that you're training on, again, is going to match the type of images that you're going to be seeing in the real world. So once you have a data set, uh, there are some other things to uh, keep in mind as you are doing some pre-processing -pro pre or you're you know, thinking about ways to architect your model. So the first is to be aware of large inputs. Um, you know, these days you can buy very impressive GPUs and uh, they can certainly crunch data on you know, very large images, for example, so thousands of pixels by thousands of pixels. Uh, remember that in mobile environments, you're going to have less processing power, less memory, and so you, know, you really want to beware of those larger inputs, and you want to shrink things down as much as possible, uh, as much as you can get away with. Um, the second point is around uh, you know, being explicit about which dimensions of input and output data you're going to be taking. Uh, so the mobile frameworks these days are a little bit more strict about this. Uh, in TensorFlow or in Keras, you can uh, define arbitrary input sizes. So in this case, uh, we've got an input vector that can take you know, any number of batches, uh, any batch size, any image height, any image width, and then has three channels. 
If you convert that just out of the box into CoreML, CoreML is going to convert all of those nuns to a dimension of one, uh, which means your CoreML model is only going to accept images that are one pixel by one pixel, which is probably not what you meant to do. Um, so just make sure to be explicit about the dimensions that you're choosing. And then again, you know this helps you uh, make sure that your images aren't too large. And then the last thing is uh, around making sure that the proportions and the orientation of all of the data that you're collecting uh, kind of match what you're going to see in mobile devices. So again, if you're doing something with images, make sure that you have some vertical video or vertical images in your training data set because that's the way a lot of people take pictures with their phone. All right, the last piece here on uh, data collection is around what happens after you've actually deployed your model. Uh, so you, know, you want to continuously be collecting data over time uh, so that you can retrain things and make sure that uh, accuracy is, is still high after you deploy your model. And when you do this in the cloud, you know, there's a lot of really great logging uh, and data capture that you kind of get for free these days. Um, so every piece of data that comes in is logged or stored somewhere and every prediction um, going out is uh, captured as well. Once things are running on edge devices, you get none of that anymore, which means you have to build a system to capture all of that data. Uh, and when you're doing that, you need to take into account the fact that you don't want to say, you know, fill a, uh, a buffer on someone's phone with gigabytes and gigabytes of live video, you also don't want to send all of that up to the cloud. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons why you're moving down to an edge device anyways. And so thinking about how to cache inputs and outputs, uh, sample that data, uh, you know, maybe sample different amounts of data on different devices if they have um, different amounts of memory on them, and then being aware of what type of connectivity the device has. Is it on Wi-Fi? Does it have a slow cellular connection uh, before you send that data back to the cloud? And then lastly, um, you know, privacy might be a big reason that you're moving your model to an edge device. And so you want to make sure that you're filtering out any data that you think should stay with, uh, on a user's device to begin with. Right, the next step in the process is training, and uh, I don't have too much here, um, but the big overarching uh, points that I want to make are, again, you know, just make sure your training environments match uh, production as closely as possible. Uh, beware of any pre- or post-processing that you're doing within the training pipeline. So, you know, if you're like me and you're using NumPy and SciPy and Pandas to do a lot of manipulation of data ahead of time, you're not going to have any of those libraries in Swift or in Java uh, when you are writing code for your mobile apps. And you know, any pre-processing or post-processing step that you do is going to have to be implemented uh, to run within that application, and that can be a very, very painful thing. So just be aware um, of what you're doing and you know, try to use as little of it as possible. Uh, and then the last thing is, you know, while today a lot of these models are being trained in the cloud, um, there are methods out there for doing distributed training on the edge. Um, Google's got a paper out on something called federated learning. Uh, I think you're going to see a, a big explosion of this in the near future. I wanted to give just a list of um, the mobile-friendly training tools out there uh, today. This isn't exhaustive, but they're the ones that really do explicitly support um, mobile-friendly models. So CoreML is Apple's uh, machine learning and deep learning specification for models. Um, they have a lot of great tooling around there. TensorFlow Lite is Google's equivalent to this. Uh, Windows has announced Windows ML, which will be hardware-accelerated machine learning on uh, Windows machines. Cafe2, uh, you know, Facebook's deep learning framework, has a mobile-friendly version called Cafe2Go. And then um, on the training tool side of things, Apple has released something called TuriCreate, uh, which is a very high-level abstraction that allows you to train uh, neural networks using transfer learning um, on custom image labels. Uh, and they will export your models directly into the CoreML format so that you can drop, drag and drop them right into your uh, iOS application. IBM Watson has announced that they support CoreML uh, natively, so anything that you train in their studio can be exported as a CoreML file. And then Microsoft's Azure Custom Vision Service will also allow you to export models directly to mobile-friendly formats. Uh, within these front, uh, mobile formats, so I've picked CoreML here on the right side, and just to give you a sense of the breadth of models that are supported, you know, yes, Neural Networks is right there on the top, a uh, very popular uh, model choice these days, but you know everything down to the lowly linear regression model, logistic regression, uh, is also supported by these mobile formats, and so uh, they're really 
isn't an excuse for not um, trying to move your model down to an edge device. A lot of things are supported. All right, so um, optimization is a step that really needs to get a lot of attention down on edge devices. Uh, you are much more constrained in the compute power and the memory that you have, and so uh, you need to think a lot more about how quickly your model is going to be able to execute. And there are really three big uh, pieces that you need to think about when optimizing. The first is which architecture you choose, um, so how your network or your model is actually defined. Um, down on the bottom right, I have uh, benchmarks for five different neural networks that all perform the same image recognition task. And you can see, you know, there's a really big difference in the runtime on different platforms. So if we look at the red bars, um, that's a Core ML model running on my new iPhone 10. An Inception V3 model will run in about 87 milliseconds uh, per inference, which is mm, not quite enough to do uh, any type of inference on live video, whereas a squeeze net model will run in about 17 milliseconds, which is more than fast enough uh, to do something in real time. So your choices here really do matter, um, and you need to be aware of what the performance is going to be when you're choosing your architecture initially. Uh, after you choose that architecture, there's uh, techniques you can use to prune uh, that neural network and remove uh, some parameters that don't add a lot to the uh, accuracy, but do uh, take a lot of computation cost. And then the last step is around compressing models so that they load into memory faster uh, and they don't take up too much space on a user's device. So if we're just talking about architecture, again, um, you know, it's good to know how quickly you think that the model is going to be able to run uh, in real time on all of these devices. Uh, we've actually built a tool. It's totally free. Uh, if you go to alchemy.fritz.ai, you can upload your uh, neural network, um, and we will actually tell you all of these characteristics. So how big is the model, uh, how many parameters does it have, and then how fast can you execute it on a device like an iPhone 10? Uh, you know, this is something that you can figure out ahead of time before you train things. And so, you know, you definitely want to make sure that your model is going to work in your use case before you take uh, the time to train it. Uh, after you train your, your network, you want to benchmark performance across multiple dimensions. Um, so, you know, you as the developer need to decide how are you going to optimize things uh, for speed, accuracy, and the size of your model. You know, there are trade-offs between all of them, and you really need to figure out what is the best balance for your applications. It's an iterative process though, uh, and the more that you can do uh, before training things, the better, because training is really what takes the most time. Within different architecture choices, um, you do have options as well. So this is an example um, from Google's MobileNet paper. Um, what One of the optimizations that they made to their architecture here is taking a standard convolution, uh, which requires a large number of floating point operations. You can see the equation down here in the bottom left. Um, it's not really important what each of those uh, uh, numbers means, but they took this standard convolution and separated it into two separate parts, which they call a depth-wise separable convolution. And the big difference here in the number of floating point operations required uh, for a depth-wise separable convolution and a standard convolution uh, is this factor n. So it requires, um, uh, in some cases, hundreds to thousands of times fewer floating point operations to uh, compute a convolution using this depth-wise separable uh, architecture than it does for the standard convolution. Uh, Google shown that you know this doesn't reduce accuracy that much, but you get a large speed up. Uh, and so you know it's not a silver bullet. You can't just go through every network and replace standard convolutions with these new convolutions. Um, but you do have choices, and you should certainly try them in an effort to reduce the number of floating point operations required to actually execute your model. Um, this mobile net paper also introduced a very coarse-grained way of pruning mobile networks. So they have something called a width multiplier, uh, which essentially is this fraction alpha, uh, which they use to throw out you know, various parameters in the network. So if you have a number of input channels to a layer, m uh, width multiplier would remove alpha uh, percent of those. And so with this uh, parameter, they can generate actually multiple different networks. So you see these green dots here on the right-hand side are many different 
versions of a uh, mobile nets architecture with different alphas applied and you can see that they require you know vastly different amounts of these matrix multiplications on the x-axis to uh, to execute and so you as the developer kind of need to choose what level of accuracy you need and what level of performance that you need and then tune the parameters of your network accordingly uh, you can also uh, do this pruning uh, with sort of a scalpel uh, instead of uh, uh, you know, a blunt instrument uh, like the width multiplier. So um, this is a great post uh, over at machinethink.net on compressing neural networks. And this is a general procedure that you can use where you go through layer by layer of your network and calculate the importance of different features just by summing all of the weights uh, in a particular filter. And it turns out that there's a certain fraction of, um, of weights that really don't contribute much at all to the overall prediction of the network. So you can see in this case, the first uh, 10 output channels uh, in this neural network layer really contribute very minimally uh, to the overall predictions of the network, whereas the you know, layers 10 through 30 uh, or filters 10 through 30 contribute a lot more. And so it's pretty safe to just throw away those first 10 um, those first 10 filters. And you know that is a large reduction in the number of matrix multiplications that have to get done to actually uh, execute this, this model. And so you can do this iteratively layer by layer in your, in your network. And in this case, uh, he was able to remove about 25% of the network and only sacrifice, I think, 3% accuracy uh, overall. So this is a nice uh, generalizable technique to remove uh, calculations in your network that don't really add too much to the overall accuracy. And then the last optimization technique that I want to talk about is uh, compression with quantization. Um, so, you know, neural networks, for example, have millions of different parameters. They're stored as floating point numbers, um, and, you know, that can take up a lot of, of memory. And so what uh, quantization does is convert those floating point weights to fixed point representations. Um, so it's sort of like binning all of those weights um, down to, you know, say 256 numbers, which can be stored as an 8-bit integer. Um, and this reduces the size of your model, uh, which uses less memory uh, and has a lot faster runtime. And the trick with quantization, though, uh, is that you really want to simulate it during the training of your network. Uh, and so TensorFlow Now and MXNet uh, actually allow you to simulate quantization during training. Uh, and you can get some pretty incredible results here. So you, know, you can speed up the execution of your model by three to five times. You can compress it to two to 10 times uh, its original size. And you only lose about zero to 5% accuracy if you make sure to simulate this quantization uh, within training. So after you have uh, optimized your model, uh, you've trained it, it's now time to convert it to a mobile-friendly format. Um, today, you know, there's the server-side frameworks like TensorFlow, Keras, Cafe2, PyTorch, and then the mobile-friendly ones like CoreML, TensorFlow Lite. Uh, the big trick with these mobile-friendly frameworks is that they can take advantage of any specialized hardware on mobile devices. So CoreML, for example, can take advantage of the new um, uh, A11 neural engine. Uh, TensorFlow Lite can take advantage of the neural network APIs and the latest Android. And so you really want to convert your models to these formats to make sure that you get the most performance on mobile devices. Uh, there are a number of open source converters out there today from CoreML tools, uh, to uh, the TensorFlow Lite converter. Uh, Microsoft and Facebook have teamed up on um, Onyx, which is an open neural network exchange format. Um, there's a lot, as I mentioned, of these open source tools out there. They're a little bit tedious to use, um, but at the end of the day, with pretty much every one of these platforms, you can write your own custom conversions to get any uh, layer from a neural network or other model on server side to work on uh, mobile devices as well. It just might be a bit of a process. So after you've got your model in a mobile-friendly format, it's going to be deployed on these edge devices. And that can be a pretty scary thing from an IP standpoint. Uh, when you deploy into a cloud environment, you control who has access to that machine. And in most cases, you know, you have an API that allows you know, only trusted data in and then predictions to come out. No one ever sees your actual model. Uh, when you deploy to a mobile device, you need to assume that someone is going to be able to access it. Uh, so, you know, in the case of CoreML, that gets bundled into an iOS application, and in about a minute or so, uh, I can actually uh, unzip that 
app bundle and take that core ML model and uh, reconstruct the neural network that you've trained from it. So if you've put a lot of time and effort into collecting proprietary data uh, and coming up with a proprietary architecture, that's a pretty scary proposition. Uh, so you're going to want to protect your model when they're deployed into edge devices. Uh, and that can come in a couple different forms. Uh, so there's encryption, uh, where you're actually storing your architecture and your parameters in an encrypted manner on the device. Um, that can make it difficult to actually interface with the uh, mobile frameworks that provide that hardware acceleration, again like CoreML or TensorFlow Lite, uh, or you can obfuscate your model. So this is provides a little bit less protection, um, but is a little bit easier to work with. So doing things like having proprietary pre-processing steps for your model, so rotating images by arbitrary degrees, um, you know, this can stop someone from you know, taking your model and just using it immediately uh, or scrambling the order that weights and layers are stored on the device and then re-scrambling them or putting them back together at runtime. Uh, someone might be able to get all of your weights and layers, but they're not going to be able to do much with it because they don't know how to put the pieces back together. Okay, we're finally ready to integrate uh, a optimized, converted, protected model into our user experience and application. Uh, I'm not going to go through the uh, actual integration steps for machine learning models on these mobile frameworks because quite frankly, uh, I think they do a pretty good job of explaining that in the documentation. If you want to see how it's done on about five different neural networks, um, check out bit.ly uh, slash heartbeat source to get um, an iOS application that we've built. Um, and you know, things to keep in mind is that you're going to need to port your pre and pro pre and post processing. Um, you have a choice on mobile devices as to whether or not you want to uh, preload your models into application bundles directly or have them fetched uh, at runtime. So you know there's a trade-off between application size and then user experience there. Um, and then you know over time I think you can really treat models as features. So when you are rolling out a new feature, you do a stage rollout, give it to a few percent of users, ramp that up if everything looks good. Um, you also want to do A-B testing of models, just like you would features, and make sure that you're keeping track of versions, right? You might have many different models that are running on many different devices for different performance reasons, and you want to make sure that you're keeping track of all that and that you're putting the right models on the right device. Once models are out in the wild, you've got to monitor them in the same way that you would monitor every other part of your application. Um, so some of the metrics that we really care about uh, at Fritz are things like, you know, how quickly is the model running on the device? How much memory is it using? How much is it draining the battery? And then, you know, what is the usage? What are people really using things for? And you can get that by looking at input data. You can get that by looking at uh, the prediction labels that are coming out. Um, but you want to collect all of these metrics and you want to slice that by the operating system that people are using, the device that the people are using, uh, the chipsets within all of those different devices. And this, you know, allows you to figure out if things are you know, going haywire, right? So putting alerts on uh, distributions of predictions or input data can really make sure that your models uh, are producing the desired user experience over time. So uh, that's all I've got for the, the life of a mobile model. Uh, I hope you've learned something about you know, how to actually do each one of these steps uh, with edge computing in mind. Um, if you just want to get started right away and you don't want to build all of this stuff yourself, uh, we are building a complete platform for edge intelligence uh, here at Fritz. Um, so you know all of these steps that I talked about are available through the Fritz web app and the Fritz SDK. Uh, if you're interested, you know, please go to uh, fritz.ai and uh, sign up or email us at info uh, at fritz.ai and we'll be happy to answer any questions. I'll leave you with some additional inspiration, just projects that I find uh, really cool. Um, this is a new paper uh, to do interactive sketching uh, and 3D model generation with deep neural networks. So as someone is drawing in real time, the neural network is actually predicting uh, what that person is going to finish drawing and then uh, building a 3D representation of that. And you know, I'm really excited about something like this for applications in, say, virtual reality where you, know, you can actually draw your own objects and then interact with them in the real world in real time. Uh, this is 
a uh, amazing piece of technology out of Skydio. So this is a drone that has 13 different cameras on it, uh, including a GoPro on the front. And then it's using essentially the same chip that is uh, in a self-driving car to track an individual and fly itself completely autonomously uh, to capture footage of that person, you know, as they are, say, biking in the woods. And so it's fusing all of these 13 camera, uh, all the images from these 13 cameras in real time, using it to avoid trees and objects and dense forests, and it still has uh, the ability to track an individual person and figure out what is a good way to capture them in you know, amazing looking video. Uh, I've talked a lot about images, but you know this counts for audio as well. So this is a diagram um, from Apple's machine learning journal on the way that the Hey Siri feature works. Uh, so they take an acoustic input and they've got a really neat um, two-level uh, process that I think is is indicative of something you might need to do yourself on um, you know, mobile devices. So they take that initial uh, piece of audio that it's always listening for. They have an always-on, very efficient. Uh, you know, low compute neural network uh, that you know very quickly tries to decide, hey, did I think I heard I hear that word Siri? And then if it does, it will pass it to a larger, more accurate neural network that runs on the main processor um, to confirm the uh, initial result. So they have this two uh, tier system where you know there's a course model that runs very efficiently that passes promising results off to a larger neural network uh, that does a more expensive computation. Um, this is a cool project. Uh, it, again, blends multiple uh, new technologies, so AR and image recognition, where um, the camera you know, predicts and uh, detects which object is in the image and then zaps into existence a uh, AR model of that thing. That's all I've got. Um, I hope that everybody here is now uh, you know, very excited about moving machine learning models down to apps. Uh, if you want to get started, again, go to www.fritz.ai. Uh, please join our community over at heartbeat.fritz.ai. And if you want some free tools uh, to benchmark your models or convert things uh, in a nice user interface, you know, go over to alchemy.fritz.ai. Um, any questions that I can answer, you know, please feel free to email me at jameson at fritz.ai. Uh, and hope to see you soon.